I had the privilege to interview a respected academic, a man on a mission, who confronts our dark history to better understand the ever-present issue of eugenic thinking. Marius Turda is an internationally recognized professor in 20th century Central and Eastern European Biomedicine at Oxford Brookes University. He is the director of the Center for Medical Humanities. He casts a truly objective view at a difficult and rather controversial subject that is often politicized, especially during the time of crises, as he states. And quite often, the idea of eugenics is oversimplified. Well, it's anything but simple, as you will hear him explain that. He rightly points out that we must look in the mirror, we must be critical with ourselves and see where our ideas originate or how and for what purpose our Western culture and the everyday use of our language was formed by certain ideologies since at least colonial times. Professor Turda authored many books and scientific papers in the subject. Find him at confront-eugenics.org and on Twitter at Marius Turda. Check out his eugenics podcast, his publications, read his books, all of which you can find via the link below in the description. And please, please share this video far and wide so others can educate themselves in this subject. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the talk. It's fantastic to have you here, Professor. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to uh, speak to you and uh, to share some of my ideas and views about eugenics. Right, let's get right into it. Let's get deep uh, into it. Uh, the idea of creating uh, perfect people within a perfect society is, is nothing new, really. We've had this idea since uh, at least Plato. Uh, but when it comes to the term eugenics, um, which is a term we use since Francis Galton, I believe, most people would as associate that term with Nazi ideology, but it's way more than that. So my question is, how did eugenics influence and transform Europe and the West? Um, you're rightly pointing out that there is a long history of eugenics, at least uh, a type of eugenic thinking that can be traced back to the classical philosophers. And certainly we have that in Plato, uh, in the Republic, where he envisions uh, his utopian um, world uh, guided by eugenic principles, in other words, the control of reproduction of certain people and the, the social division and the cultural division within that society. Uh, also, we are familiar with what can be called infanticide eugenic practices. They were popular amongst the ancients, particularly we know the case of Sparta. But we also have examples of other societies across the world um, which basically would abandon uh, babies or children with, with, with um, uh, physical you know, uh, um, disabilities, shall we say, uh, or really get rid of the older people. So yes, there is a certain uh, uh, history behind the thinking that, you know, um, certain people are more valued than others. Uh, but as you rightly um, also pointed out, uh, it is with with the emergence of Darwinism uh, uh, and, and positivism uh, in the 19th century and overall of, of secularization and modernization that uh, uh, eugenics emerges in the, in the way we recognize it today. And it was indeed Francis Galton, the English polymath, who coined the term in 1883. He experienced, uh, he experimented with various uh, options before that. For example, he used the term stirpiculture or stirpiculture. You know, uh, stirpe is the Italian word for race, kin, family, tribe. But it sounded slightly awkward in English. And um, I mean, of course, at the beginning, eugenics sounded as awkward, I suppose. Uh, I see. As you can imagine, but now it's much easier to pronounce it. Um, so Galton actually was the one who, uh, being obsessed with, their, with, with how heredity works, being it really interested in the preservation of, of, of certain cultural and social um, uh, privileges associated with his class. Um, he became very much uh, uh, focused on uh, trying to formulate 
what he called the science of eugenics in the 1880s. And as I said, it was very much helped by the fact that by then we have a proper theory of evolution produced by Charles Darwin, his half cousin. And also we have a very big debate uh, within sociology or emerging sociologies uh, uh, about the, the, the role of um, society and how society is to be uh, um, looked at. Um, you have people like uh, um, Herbert Spencer, August Comte. Uh, and finally, there is a cultural, more broader debate in the West, um, which is about modernity and what modernity does to us. In other words, you know, people were very critical of how quickly we modernized, how quickly urbanized, industrialized, and we lost a great deal of, uh, of what, um, you know, defenders of tradition would claim was the soul and the spirit of of the society or of the of the nation, and so there's a there's the generalized feeling that by 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 the end of the 19th century, we're going down the drain. You know, if something doesn't happen, something doesn't intervene, and people are not taking action immediately, uh, we are witnessing uh, a widespread degeneration caused by everything from alcoholism to criminality, people. Um, with uh, disabilities are becoming more and more numerous. Uh, and of course, this is uh, uh, connected um, with a, a feeling, which we could hear today as well, that the white people or the white race are losing their preeminence and their dominance, and uh, we're basically in decline. So the big replacement theory, uh, we are, we we created in a, a Western culture, we're slightly uh, going out of history now. We're going to be replaced by these non-white people who are inferior to us. Uh, so that's the context uh, within which eugenics emerges and then really, really captivates a great deal of people. You have politicians, you have activists, uh, you have feminists, you have anarchists, you have conservative radicals, you have racists. They're really trying to pick and match, as it were, mix and match, as we say today, what was convenient to their particular ideology and particular interest in a social problem. Uh, and uh, by 1900, or by the time Gorton uh, uh, passed away in 1911, you have eugenic societies in Germany, in Britain, in Sweden, in, in the United States. You have eugenic journals. The Eugenics Review was launched in 1909 in London. The, um, the, the Journal for Social and Racial Biology, uh, was the first one in the world, was uh, was established in Germany in 1905. Uh, by 1913-14, you have already eugenic societies in Central Europe. So there you have a very solid uh, and quite complicated uh, uh, conversation about eugenics, very theoretical. Some of it is very scientific, it's connected to the debate on mentalism, biometrics, uh, anthropology. Some of it is quite popular uh, and popularized. You have eugenic congresses in 1912 in London. Uh, so a, a, a big and complex history before the Nazis come to power in 1933. In other words, there is a, an important part of the uh, history of eugenics we need to know, which is very global, very European in many ways. Um, and American before 1930s. Then, of course, the Nazis come in, as you know, and they really capitalize on it. So eugenics becomes a national policy, civilization law, the T4 program, and then the Holocaust. And then afterwards, we have we have these uh, uh, interpretations who, which obviously are quite rightly uh, are, are, are highlighting this extreme form of eugenics, Nazi eugenics. The problem was, of course, that after a while, the conversation only gravitated around uh, Nazi Germany, uh, whilst developments and uh, very important legacies of eugenics in other countries were not only marginalized, nor looked at, but completely ignored. So, you know, in the 1990s, when I started looking at the history of eugenics, uh, I did not know anything about uh, uh, other parts of the world, apart from Germany, of course, a bit about Britain, uh, the, sort of the classical history of the 19th century, and something about the United States, uh, even the Scandinavian countries, which, as you probably know, had sterilization laws until the 1970s. There were no research in the early 1990s. Only in 1996, 1997, we have a proper book about 
uh, eugenics in the Scandinavian context. And then, of course, that kind of thing sort of cascaded uh, into a, a lot of conversation in the Scandinavian uh, context, in, in Sweden in particular, but also Norway, Finland, um, Iceland, um, and then in connection to social democracy and non-totalitarian regimes which favour eugenics. And then uh, was a renewed interest in British eugenics in that context, because obviously it was slightly considered to be um, uh, appropriate uh, to, to compare Britain to, to Sweden or to Scandinavian uh, countries. And then uh, by the sort of early 2000, the, 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 the entire conversation goes in so many directions, including East Central Europe, which was previously completely ignored. So even if you look at this historiographically, you realise that uh, a global focus is, is important because it truly shaped uh, uh, the, the modern world. And um, while you know, it is legitimate to look at it through the prism of Nazism, eugenics did not disappear with the defeat of Adolf Hitler. Eugenics continued after the Holocaust uh, and uh, continued in ways which are, uh, you know, interestingly more problematic in many ways than what is uh, traditionally looked at in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and now we're trying to get our head around it and, and try to understand how come that it survived, considering the horrors of the Holocaust and how many um, and millions of people were discriminated against, was uh, uh, institutionalized, was sterilized, were uh, uh, abused physically and mentally in the name of eugenics. So how was it possible that this continued uh, uh, until very recently? Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to ask the question, how come that epistemologically we didn't put the same effort and understanding this as much as we did with racism or anti-Semitism or, uh, you know, ethnic nationalism, ideologies with which, of course, eugenics work very, works very well. Um, so we are now at a sort of critical moment, uh, favoured, of course, by what's happening in the world. You know, we had the pandemic, which really brought forward a lot of debate about who is worth living and how it's worth uh, to, to live. Um, then the war in Ukraine and the invasion uh, uh, of Ukraine by Russia, which really uh, re 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 reactualized or um, uh, brought forward again the importance of ethnic nationalism, reimagining of history, the importance of cultural memory, the whole thing about Nazism. Um, so we are in a moment where uh, this conversation is happening, and um, it is important not to forget to bring in. The history of eugenics. Uh, if it was only for historiographic reasons or for the for the for the reasons related to historical memory, it would still be important to have it. Let alone, as I try to very sketchily point out, it's actually something that influences us to this day. We are continually living in a eugenic mindset when we see someone with disability, when we talk about laws uh, re regarding uh, bioethics medical ethics, we talk about cloning, we talk about assisted reproduction, we look at the debate in Canada now about MAID, medical assistance in suicide, in, 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 uh, uh, medical um, assistance in um, um, in death, sorry. Yeah. Um, so this continues to impact so many of our lives. It echoes so widely within our of social realities that to not be aware of it and not to engage with it critically and historically uh, is very problematic in my in my opinion. Taking, and, taking, <laughs> and taking sides really easily and uh, jumping to conclusions without actually knowing how deep the roots go as you often say. Um, and even in Scotland I mean it's not just Canada it's Scotland today so uh, to me it's, it's absolutely insane what is when I, when I see it and what what is also insane um, at least for, for myself that I never heard of eugenics being so widespread and global until until I found that found out about it in your books um, and since we are on your books um, you have a wonderful wonderful um, and and um, huge um, book about um, Eastern European and, and Hungarian eugenics um, can you please tell us? I, I, that's uh, that's the one about Central European eugenics, which I can show um, if you want to um, 
uh, popularized that, and that's the one about Hungarian eugenics, which that's of course one, yes. benefited for a very thick uh, Romanian translation um, recently. So, as you can imagine, there was a lot of interest in in the neighboring country of Romania, um, of uh, of course about Hungarian eugenics. And it's it's available online. If someone wants to buy it, they can they can purchase it, and and it's fantastic read. I mean, it's it's not easy. So it's full of information. It's it's a historical um historical um um, book but um we've got we've got so much um knowledge within that i i call it you know not religiously but just to to express its um its um depth it's the bible of eugenics in in my view um again not on a religious note history of eugenics rather than eugenics so just to clarify Mm -hmm. don't want people to think that actually we are promoting uh, eugenics. Uh, it could oh, be yes, of course. Sorry. Yes. Of, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Of, well, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. It's a history of eugenics, of course. Yes. So thank you for clarifying that. If someone misunderstands me. So, <clears throat> so there was a moment in Hungary in the early 19th century when eugenics really got on foot, and uh, pretty much the entire um, intellectual um, community picked it up, lifted it up, and um, my question to you is what was different about it, if any, compared to Western ideas or or uh, eugenics evolving in, in Western Europe and, and in America? Mm. Yeah, um, Hungary is a, a very interesting case uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, it emerges within, of course, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire or monarchy, uh, within the Habsburg Empire, Austro-Hungarian monarch, it emerging as a very uh, um, forward-looking country. It, it's very keen to modernize quickly. Budapest is uh, uh, the city it looks today. Basically, it really expands. Budapest and, and Pest become one in the 80s, 70s, 80s. There is an, a, a major program of, of modernizing the city, from uh, new buildings to improving living conditions. Uh, and uh, to transforming Budapest in the capital of an empire. Um, the Hungarian state um, looked at, understood as a, a, a kind of multi-ethnic state, but within that, of course, the, the, the Magyars or the Hungarians constituting the political and cultural and scientific elites. Um, and as they were picking up various uh, traditions of how to transform their state and their country, and finally, in a way, believing they are on the way to making Hungary Hungarian after centuries of not having that uh, state uh, uh, belonging to them. Uh, uh, they picked up not only on, on, on traditions related to uh, urbanism or tradition related to economic development. Um, they also picked up, very interestingly, on scientific traditions. They were popular at the time in, in Europe and the world. And so there's a very strong debate about what kind of economic development, uh, what kind of economic uh, theories work for Hungary? You know, it's, it's, it's European, but not quite as advanced as it, it is industrialized, but not as industrialized as England or Germany. So you have this debate then and now, you know, where do we belong between East and West? And which which better works for us? So they start uh, discussing these major, uh, major debates about what is the future uh, for us. Within that debate, uh, people on the left and on the right, uh, feminists and um, you know Jewish intellectuals start adopting what was the dominant convers- uh, narrative at the time, which was about eugenics and uh, eugenic uh, narrative of national and individual improvement. So what it what was very surprising to me, I didn't know anything about it until sort of the 1993, 1994, when uh, Kovac Maria Maria Kovac, uh, a very important Hungarian uh, a professor at the university. Uh, of Central European University in Budapest, uh, published a book on uh, 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 Hungarian physicians and lawyers and their uh, sort of um, interest in anti-Semitism in the interwar period. And she mentions some of the, the eugenic work these people are interested in. And I was very, uh, uh, very surprised because obviously I grew up in a tradition that we didn't speak about Eastern European eugenics, we didn't speak about European racism. I didn't know anything about Hungary uh, apart from Although I studied 19th century and I did my I did my um, sort of my my BA and my MA on Hungarian topics, uh, these were not um, 
taught or you could not find anything in the books. Um, so uh, then I, 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 I wanted to understand why was the case and whether it was marginal, insignificant, or it was something else there. So I spent about 20 years uh, researching uh, Hungarian uh, eugenics and, uh, all the way to the 1950s. So the book that you mentioned is the first one. The second one is coming out now, which is about race and national character in Hungary. Uh, so uh, it, it continues the conversation in the into a period. Um, so then I realized not only that Hungarian eugenicists uh, were actually um, very well read, and uh, which is not surprising because obviously all of them were like prominent physicians, prominent scientists. They were absolutely fluent in German and French, some of them even in English. They studied in Germany and uh, in France, obviously. Anyone who studied in Germany in the early 1900s would have come across all this debate about race and eugenics, which was so popular in Germany. So that was the other thing you know, that always crossed my mind. So we're so keen to highlight, you know, all the Hungarians were in no way different in terms of their scientific creativity. They were so uh, up to date to uh, debates across Europe. But then obviously all of the debates about race and eugenics, they completely, you know, close their eyes and uh, cover their ears. Um, and didn't make any sense, right? So either you accept that they were indeed completely attuned to everything that was going on in the world at the time in Europe and in America, or you simply say, well, they were selectively <laughs> and consciously separating this from everything that now we consider to be uh, problematic or bad or really uh, difficult for us to accept. And I realize this is a very uh, um, um, unhealthy uh, historiographic argument. And I started digging and digging. And then what, it, what, I, what I arrived at was phenomenal. Uh, so this was before, of course, that the whole debate about eugenics turned very racist. Um, so you have people on the left talking about eugenics in relation to, you know, how can we modernize Hungarian society? We need to improve the quality of living. We need to improve the quality of the population. We need less drunkards. Uh, we need uh, healthy families. I mean, a lot of the conversation, which continues to this day, you know, what is to be Hungarian? How can we protect our Hungarian families in comparison to, say, the time, of course, where the Germans, the uh, the Roma and the Romanians in various areas uh, and the Slovaks? How can we promote the Hungarian element? And this is not simply a nationalist ret rhetoric, but it's at the same time, how can we help the Hungarians uh, thrive economically, so socially and culturally? It's not enough to have five Hungarians in the village if they come by land and all of them are alcoholics. Eugenicists will come and say, uh, so there was nothing uh, uh, at, at first glance about race or racism here. It was simply about thinking, well, we need to actually improve the, the quality of the population in this way. So a lot of the people on the left would actually start talking about this, you know, what happens with the workers in the city. So in, in cities like, like Budapest or Kolozsvár, uh, Cluj, uh, a lot of the leftist eugenicists uh, in the early 1900s, particularly after Husserl de Sasso, the famous journalist established by Yassi Oskar and his friends, they have a very strong uh, group of intellectuals who actually try to, to, to modernize uh, um, and help people in, in, in cities and in the villages. Of course, at the same time, you have a, a nationalist conservative rhetoric, both Catholic and Protestant, that talks about the Hungarian race, in a way that we we can call it today racist, very nationalistic, and for them eugenics obviously was about promoting the racial qualities. So they should not intermarry with Romanians. They should not intermarry with the Roma. They should keep uh, 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 they should keep their purity in a way uh, uh, untouched. That's something that you know Dejo Sabo would develop later on in the 1920s in his famous uh, novel, you know, uh, The Village Swept Away. Basically, you know, the, the, we need to separate the Germans from the from the Hungarians and the Germans, or for him, uh, um, the German minority in Hungary were for 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 for, him, for example the the, the the racial enemy. Uh, so you have all these ideas circulating, and that's internally speaking. So obviously, if you're not familiar with, with the very complex debates about national identity in Hungary at the end of the 19th century. And very few people in the West are, because obviously, we can't, if you can't speak the language or read the original texts, you wouldn't know how complicated this was. You know, the divide between rural and urban, 
which in the populist movement uh, at the time, you know, uh, the, the, those uh, populist writers, the Napier, uh, they were called, all of these sorts of things are completely difficult to explain to someone who is not familiar with the region. Within that, imagine that complex story, complex narrative is like a, a, a texture so dense with so many threads. Imagine within that comes eugenics and kind of, you know, tries to, to put it all together. Uh, and this is, we're talking about a period which is before 1914, so there's still a great deal of uh, optimism and enthusiasm, uh, which we could see, of course, in 1896 with the celebration, the Millennium Celebration, when Hungary believes they are finally amongst the top European nations in the world, uh, sorry, European nations and the top uh, nations in the world. Uh, so there is a certain nationalist fervour, there's a great optimism that Hungary is, you know, becoming that country. Um, so that's the period where all of these ideas circulate. And you have psychiatrists, you have physicians, you have um, social workers, you have politicians uh, discussing this. They start to go to conferences, uh, important people like Teleki Pal, uh, Prime Minister Twice, Hofmann Geisel from Transylvania, born in, in Oradia. Opati Ishvan, another famous uh, Transylvanian uh, uh, um, scientist. Um, he was the director of the Institute of Anatomy in Kolozsvár, Cluj. So we're talking about people who finally become organized. And with the Academy of Sciences, they create a first committee on eugenics in 1914. Uh, all of these traditions come together. You still have the left and the right working together. So it's interesting because after once the war uh, erupts, you would have people on the left like Mozart, Yozhev, very prominent communists working together together with Hoffman, who was obviously a conservative radical and the one who actually is the most famous uh, Hungarian eugenicist in many ways because he was well connected to, he was consul in America, he was well connected to the American eugenicist, he published the first book in German on American eugenics in the world, then he moved to Germany and he became a member of the German eugenic movement, he was very close to prominent German eugenicists he died very young. He died in 1921. Uh, he was deplored by German eugenicists like Fritz Lenz, for example, as one of the founding fathers of the German eugenic movement. So he was really, really uh, important. And he returns to Hungary in 1917. Teleki uh, uh, is asking him to reorganize the entire eugenic movement in Hungary in connection to what the war is, is, is challenge is, is, is offering both in terms of uh, possibilities and uh, more importantly, I suppose, in terms of the challenges. So Hoffman works with Teleki, uh, at this, um, um, trying to uh, uh, see what will happen after the war. I mean, this is still the moment where they don't know about Trianon, right? So they don't know whether what will happen. Even if they lose the war, they could not really uh, conceptualize. I mean, no one in Hungary in 19, uh, as late probably as 1918, would have seriously think that Hungary could collapse um, as a state. Uh, I think even when they accept it, it's going to be defeated. And Tiso Ishvan, of course, declares this in parliament and is assassinated. You know, when we lost the war, they realize this is really bad for us. Um, eugenicists within this political culture are trying, uh, uh, they are trying to find a way to uh, what they call, you know, we need to protect as many Hungarians as we can. So they're very concerned, for example, with working with the invalids and, and people, uh, you know, who return from the war. Because from a racial point of view or eugenic point of view, even if you lost a leg, you could still be a good father. But then, of course, they realize we need to introduce eugenic schemes like, OK, we, know, we will give you land, for example. So we're going to we're not going to give land to someone who's a Serb or a Romanian, although, of course, at the time they were still part of Hungary or part of the Hungarian army. We're going to prefer only Hungarian was they called, you know, Foy Magyar, Hungarian defined by not just language, but uh, for at least three generations, uh, family Hungarian to help that. So they started already talking about these things. Uh, and um, then the war finishes. And of course, what happens, you have this the period where some of these ideas, particularly the, the radical racist ones are in a way abandoned during the communist exper experiment. A lot of the social uh, and in a way, uh, medical aspects of eugenics, which were already very present in Hungary uh, before 1918, are experimented with during the communist uh, uh, republic, particularly the whole discussion about people with mental disabilities and what do we do, where do we put them in the hospitals? And there's a, but of course it's short lived. 
uh, and then comes, of course, uh, uh, you know, the the peace conference at Trianon, and sort of the the whole thing is sort of is re reconfigured. So um, when I looked at this, and I realized that uh, there is so much we can learn from that, from the Hungarian case study. Not only that, important uh, scientists uh, are not known today, right? I mean, apart from a very group. A uh, small group of uh, historians of medicine who actually looks at all these uh, scientists who were so important at the time. Because at the time, of course, being a, a, a professor at university um, meant not just um, sort of teaching your specialism, but also you had a very active public and cultural life. All of these people uh, are present of societies, of organization for various cultural activities. You know, in Transylvania, uh, where these people activated, there were major uh, associations promoting Hungarian culture, from newspapers to journals to, you know, hiking. They will go, you know, into the mountains and, you know, build a, a healthy body, you know, and talk about, uh, you know, what uh, we need for the young people, religious uh, 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 activities. Obviously, that was a type of intellectual that existed at the time. And this is very interesting because a lot of them, while can and did approach eugenics through their specialism, so if they were biologists or psychiatrists or physicians in general, they could understand actually a lot of this conversation about eugenics, <coughs> excuse me, from the point of view of their uh, area of expertise. But even more interestingly to me is then when they go outside their area of expertise and try to in implement that or to disseminate that to the general public, because this is how it works, yeah. So um, that's that's uh, that's one aspect. The other one, of course, I wanted to make sure that uh, people who are not familiar with the Hungarian case study can and would learn about famous, as it were, Hungarian eugenicists, because they were very important at the time and they deserve recognition the way other authors deserve recognition, and they are talked about in in the scholarship. And thirdly, and perhaps problematically uh, is clearly how much of these ideas survived not only the interval period to me that's that's a big chunk of course because we have the holocaust and sort of hungarian racism in, in the interval period and anti-semitism and of course the whole thing in the 90 between 1940 1945 um and then uh, the communist period and then, of course, today, um, that's the that's the, the interesting bit, you know, how many of these conversation about who is Hungarian, what is Hungarian, what is the Hungarian family, the pro-natalist eugenic rhetoric of the 1920s. Um, we are not, you know, we're not mixing with other races. We are slightly different. Uh, we know all of this sort of rhetoric and examples that are being given by, by, by recent politicians for the past 10 years. I found it very sh um, um, disturbing in the way that uh, uh, allows me to uh, affirm or to say it out loud that this is possible to some extent, not because uh, it is uh, disingenuous. So it's not just populist talk here. It is possible because there is a genuine interest and concern within the Hungarian uh, community, both in Hungary and abroad, that, uh, you know, we're disappearing. We know enough. Uh, and this is kind of a scare that exists in the 19th century, exists in the 1920s, uh, and then what do we do about it? And uh, all of these eugenic ideas uh, were part and parcel of that conversation about Hungarian identity. And in order to understand them better, we need to actually do it. Uh, we need to go back in time. We need to unpack trajectories of thought. We need to explain where this conversation comes from. And some of it, yes, some of it has got a very clear eugenic heritage and that has to be called out. Uh, so it is uh, it is relevant in this way too that uh, uh, we are learning a bit more about Hungary because you know as you know uh, politically speaking at the moment and diplomatically speaking Hungary is is quite in the center of attention not only due to the war in Ukraine but also due to the fact that every now and then there will be an outburst of rather uh, disturbing um, you know, racist or um, nationalist, ethnic nationalist, uh, uh, um, which uh, happens, uh, particularly when some of the leaders of uh, travel to Transylvania, where it seems to be the place where they really, really enjoy saying quite nasty things about, 
about what what Hungary is supposed to be doing. Um, so yes, there are so many uh, levels of, of of urgency here uh, that we need to look at, and uh, it might be difficult because obviously, as I pointed out, uh, it's a very complex history, and Hungary has a very complex history, uh, and people don't take the time to probably read everything and to understand it properly. They, like you say, that you easily jump to conclusions, uh, and um, that's not good either. So it's not easy to simply call a, a politician racist uh, without actually understanding the, the the long history of Hungarian debate about, say, uh, what is uh, national identity, national character, uh, family, or the role played by religion. It's very easy to call him racist, uh, although it's certainly what he says or she says may sound racist to us, but actually within the context of the, the debate in that particular country, all makes sense. He or she knows exactly that these uh, words uh, echo and uh, are understood by the audience because the audience already uh, digested, internalized a century or more of uh, eugenics and uh, debate about how can we protect ourselves. And uh, this is not just about, you know, geography, uh, because as we know, as a uh, Sachin, you said, you know, Hungary is not, Hungary will be. So uh, it's not just about <coughs> the, we love the territory, it's also that we are immortal as, an, as long as the nation lives, it doesn't matter where we are or what the Hungarians are, the nation is eternal. And I can confirm, and thank you so much for the, the extensive answer. It, it's terrific to hear you talk about this. Um, and I, you are absolutely right. I can confirm that still this this kind of worry for the nation worry for heritage worry for lineage and also worry for um um running out of time it still exists in hungary running out of time to to multiply in a, in, a, in a eugenics kind of terminology um or, or to to uh, well well anyway um we're, we're shortly running out of time and and I want to ask you, have we got time for one more short question? Because because I'm, I'm really curious what you think about the future and um, not not just future of Hungary, future future of eugenics. Uh, we see things like, um, and you earlier alluded to that uh, in a way, you mentioned uh, some examples of current uh, eugenics thinking uh, or it existing in current societies. So if, for example, transhumanism, um, people like uh, Nick Bornstrom, people like um, Ray Kurzweil, or even back going back to the environmentalist movement, or Julian Huxley, who's, who wrote the founding paper for UNESCO, people like that, who, whose grandfather was actually, uh, you know, Darwin's bulldog, a famous eugenicist. So <clears throat> does it exist today? And you said yes, but, but uh, what do you predict? In one of your recent talks um, in Warsaw, um, which is a f the, which was the first international humanity society identity congress in Warsaw, you said that time and time, time and again, identity is politicized. This sometimes resulted in horrendous outcomes, particularly in moments of social and political crisis. And here we are. Um, in in a, I think we're heading towards a big crisis, and we are already in it. So, what do, what do you predict? Um, well, it's hard to predict uh, certain things um, because situation the situation is so much in flux. And you mentioned some of the authors, uh, and that's one big conversation we're having uh, in connection to uh, uh, transhumanism, um, human enhancement, genetic technologies, uh, cloning, uh, and all, all in all, sort of in what way can we talk about a new eugenics? which is, uh, as, as some of these people like Sir Bolesko Bostrom will put it, is, is um, non-interventionist, is not totalitarian, is not state-directed, but it's personal. So if I decide that I want to, uh, um, you know, and I can afford it, of course, because it's all about money, ultimately, if I decide that I want to choose the colour uh, of uh, my baby's eyes, why shouldn't I, if I want to um, screen for genetic uh, um, you know, uh, disabilities, why shouldn't I, if I want to eradicate down uh, because my, um, you know, someone in the family had it, 
So you have this big conversation about, uh, which is, I think, very problematic, ethically speaking, from my point of view, because I think these people are simply playing with human emotions and they're simply cynical in many ways, because first of all, we know how little consent there is when it comes to, oh, you know, the doctor or the geneticist will just advise, but you'll make the own decision. We know that this is not really the case. Very few people actually are non-influenced by all of these. Uh, and we see this with, with, with radical examples of people, uh, women in particular, who st continue to be sterilized until very recently. We saw that in, in Australia, we saw this in so North Carolina, sorry. Uh, we saw that in Alberta, in Canada. So this has happened a few years ago. So of course, there is a discussion where the physician or the nurse will tell you, you know, these are the benefits and the, 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 you know, the side effects. Uh, but, you know, if I'm in labor or, you know, in a state of subconscious, I'm, am I able to give you informed consent? Or if I speak to a geneticist or a physician who's very, you know, uh, um, uh, is very hard on, on, on using um, jargon language or terms I don't understand, how much informed consent is there? I, I completely don't get it anyway. And so on and so forth. So I'm trivializing a bit to drive the point home that namely, um, when people talk about, you know, the individual decisions, I think we have to be careful how much is that actually. Uh, so that's one segment. The other one is what I called, and this is something that I'm, I'm interested in more recently, I'm trying to understand how the dehumanizing language of eugenics continues to influence us. And you could see this happening in moments of crisis. Uh, so we continue to, uh, uh, I mean, in Europe, if you look, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, eugenic dehumanization of the Roma continues uninterrupted. They're still undesired, they're still asocials, they're still parasites, inferior. All of that language dehumanizes them to the point that actually it, it becomes uh, possible and it is permissive to treat them differently. You know, their, their intelligence is not at the same level as ours. They could be in a special group or in the class. We can we do special programs for them in the way that basically we did with the reservations. You know, we put them in, in special schools. Everything that that is very obviously it's eugenically informed, it's very biased and it, it's simply in the name of uh, uh, we're doing something for them. Basically, it doesn't give them a sense of humanity, the one that is shared by the majority. At the same time, as I could see this with COVID and the debate about disability, which is very prominent at the moment, is, is that, that the language that was created by the eugenicists continues to inform our perception of these people. All of the, the words we use normally when we talk about people with disabilities, particularly people with learning difficulties or learning disabilities, like, you know, idiot or moron or, you know, feeble-minded, all of these are eugenic words. They were created by people to catalog, uh, uh, um, separate, um, and and, uh, and then institutionalize and uh, penalize and treat people who, once they are categorized or cataloged in this way or, or labeled in this way, once the eugenic stigma is attached to them, then it becomes possible to do that because obviously they're not like you. You know, you are, you know, you are a moron. Your intelligence is, you know, over six year old. Uh, so then obviously I'm going to treat you like a six year old. So once this becomes accepted, no matter whether this is false. Or, uh, or not. And in most cases, it was false, obviously. It was based on I, the physician, or the, um, the psychologist, or the psychiatrist, simply attaching the label to you. So understanding this language and how important language is uh, to shape reality and shape perception, it's, it's relevant to seeing where the conversation is going in the future. Because I don't think whilst we can fight uh, uh, various developments uh, in genetics, and we can uh, uh, we can say, well, you know, whatever we do, uh, from cloning to uh, human enhancement, we have to take the ethical aspect into account. That we have to make sure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated, and people should understand the history of eugenics in order to learn from it. That's one level. However, at the level of the population, you know, which is the important thing, I suppose, in many ways. Uh, people are completely uh, 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 unreserved in using or un, uh, uh, unscrupulous and uncritical uh, in using eugenic uh, uh, ways of reflecting uh, a reality. And then we have to intervene here. You know, if you were to have to have a debate with the geneticist now, the geneticist will tell you straightforwardly, well, oh, no, 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 I'm not a eugenicist. So it's the same with, with these guys promoting human enhancement. They will say, well, we're not eugenicists because these are guys, you know, they were racist and 
they immediately find a way to get out of the, the, the question and simply say, well, you don't understand us. Well, we're proposing something entirely different. And then you say, OK, well, uh, let's explain this a bit. But then there's the conversation. Whilst, of course, it's very different when we look at what's happening at the moment in the crisis we're going through uh, globally, nationally and individually, some of us, very difficult to leave. Uh, um, the economic crisis is, is, is getting deeper. The recession, the war, now the the the, um, the absolutely horrific uh, earthquake in Turkey and Syria. You realise that actually we are. Uh, uh, this is not, not bringing in uh, uh, the whole debate about overpopulation, ecology, environmentalism, which again has a very long eugenic uh, tradition in the night from the 1950s onwards. Uh, you realise that actually we do need to be more uh, forthcoming, more aggressive even to really question the fundamental premises of, of, of this uh, and then actually push forward to a way to overcome it and, and, and come together and think of a, a future that is still uh, livable uh, for all of us, not just for some of us. Thank you very much. You very and much. One, one more thing. Um, you are working really hard to spread the word. You're educating people all over the world. You're giving lectures. Uh, I will leave links to your um, to your social media and your books. When can we expect the next next book to come out? Um, about yeah, at the moment I'm I'm I'm, I'm... I'm traveling with this exhibition on the legacies of eugenics, uh, which uh, you can find out more uh, about if you look at my uh, public engagement project, which is called Confront Eugenics. Uh, so um, I'll be going to Sweden uh, and then uh, America. Uh, so in connection to the exhibition, which is about the global legacies of eugenics, I, I give talks and I try to, uh, uh, you know, um, engage in conversations uh, about what eugenics is, the legacies uh, and uh, the importance uh, uh, for our reckoning uh, today. Uh, at the same time, uh, as I as mentioned already, I'm, I'm finishing now this book on Hungarian eugenics and uh, national character and race, which uh, will be submitted this year. And there will be a book on Romanian uh, racism, uh, which will come in, in, uh, also this year. So. Uh, I haven't quite forgotten about uh, the East Central European um, chapter of this global saga or this global narrative or this uh, global movie, <laughs> but um, um, it is it, it was very important to me to always go back there and um, uh, engage um, with, with the conversation there uh, because that mu is much needed. And um, this is why I was uh, very grateful to your invitation uh, uh, because uh, obviously you're doing exactly the same thing. Uh, this is something that bridges a global conversation with a, a national conversation in Hungary, and this is extremely important. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and please keep up the good work and take care of yourself. I hope to speak to you in the future. Thank you.